Sheriff, what do we got here? Well, Dave, I introduced you to the new 912 IS engine for injected super, which is the 100 horsepower new engine just released by Rotax. And maybe we'll kind of run down some of the differences for those people familiar with the older version or the existing carbureted version. Right off the bat, on top of the engine, we're going to notice that we have a plastic air intake box. And when we have the name on top, but it looks significantly different because we no longer have the two carburetors that protrude past the ring mount on the back. Now we have an air throttle intake which comes off on the number one and uh, three side. Single lever. So your throttle mechanism is a single lever, no more dual carburetors, therefore no more carburetor balancing. And because it's a dry inlet, there's no more carb icing issues, so you won't have any need to put on a carb heat system. The other thing you'll notice is there's the sensors are all mounted on the engine. All of the sensors feed an electronic system uh, for engine control. Right away, just uh, you'll notice over top of the valve covers, we have the injector covers. Now, each cylinder has two injectors. So there's actually two injector paths controlled by the computer. And of course, each cylinder still maintains dual ignition, so we have still have our dual spark plugs. A little difference that people maybe don't notice is the fact that the cylinders themselves are actually different on the head part. The head has got a larger cooling capacity. You see by this larger boss around the exhaust port. Well, it physically doesn't change in dimension from exhaust port to exhaust port. The cooling passages are larger, better valve cooling and better uh, performance out of valve life. The pistons and cylinders stayed the same from the older generation engine, but if we move inward to the engine, you'll notice the crankcase is painted black. Now this is the same type of painting process. This is the same painting process that they use in the motorcycle line engines, so it's a very tried and true system. This is going to give us corrosion protection we did not have before, and it's also painted on the inside of the block, which will help for oil drain back. Now, for those of you very familiar with the technical side, if we look at the bottom of the block, the bottom of the block actually changed. The bottom of the block is now a keel. The structure actually dropped a few millimeters, and the bottom is now keeled together like a boat, so oil recovery is much cleaner. We've done away with the banjo bolt at the bottom of the engine. Now we have our recovery fittings come off to the side for oil recovery and on the ignition end for a tractor version and we also have one on the uh, gearbox end for a pusher conversion. So that's a big change. In addition, yeah, the oil pump itself, for those of you who are familiar with it, will notice that there's a, a big change in the pump and it's physically larger. Now we've increased it internally from a four rotor system, we've gone to six rotors. This is going to reduce some of the pulsation that we see sometimes on oil pressure gauges and on oil pressure meters. In addition, we have a much larger um, pressure relief valve internally. So it's been completely redesigned. We do have on, the, on this component, we have our oil inlet port. We have the takeoff if you were going to run a governor. And uh, at the bottom, there's another fitting. And this allows a different oil inlet fitting as well. So this is a, an option, depending on the configuration from the manufacturer. This also inside, uh, there's a seal on the shaft. The shaft itself has changed internally. So the oil pump went through a complete redesign and upgrade. This was actually follow on to our adding in the oil filters recently a one way check valve. This now makes the system far more positive, less likely to have drain back or leak back into the crankcase. So it's a big improvement in the oil system on this model engine. Now, the fuel system wise, how are they supplying fuel to the injectors? Well, because it's a pressurized system, in other words, this is going to run the pressure balance rail, and on the pressure end of the pressure balance rail, we have a fuel pressure regulator, which is integral to the engine. This is a three bar or 45 psi system. Now, to get the pressure in the system, I'll come around on this side, you'll see. We have a. This is where we connect. It's got a cover on it here. We have an AN fitting. And this AN fitting would be connected by a fuel line, and each engine is going to come with 
a stainless fuel pump box. And internal in this, we have an inlet side, again with an AN fitting, which would come in and it goes into a high pressure pump, a vein pump. There is a one-way check valve, we use and air check valves, that then feeds to another high pressure pump and another one-way check valve on the outlet side. We run dual pumps, they're individually wired, they would, there's an inlet in the wiring harness for this. And what's going to happen in this system is you will have two switches so you can check each pump individually on startup. Now, this system comes complete with the stainless box, so it meets with the ASTM compliant fire regulations and for certification on FAA Part 33 fire regulations. This is part of the engine package. Now, running uh, dual pumps, then, is there any difference in the electrical system to charging that evidence? Well, actually, the electrical system has gone through a complete redesign, and I'm glad you asked that. If you look at the rear of the engine, let's just start with the real simple part of the electrical system, the starter. Compared to our old starter, this is significantly shorter, but it maintains the high torque that we had in our old system. So it's an improvement in the starter, better material, and it, uh, it's a shorter starter, so we have less clearance issues and less installation issues. Likewise, when I look at the rear of the engine, we can no longer see the flywheel. Like a motorcycle, because we're going to now put out much more current, we have some available 30 watts for charging and there's an additional 16 watts that is going to run the ignition and injection system. But to control the heat that that would generate, this is now oil cool. So there's no more flywheel that you see spinning around and no more problem in that area. Now starting from the, the stator plate, the stator plate is divided basically into a uh, 16 amp and then a 430 amp system. We'll call it, for lack of a better term, the small one is A and the big one is B. When the engine starts, when I start the engine, we have a fuse box that would be attached and inside the fuse box is a set of capacitors, one for each ignition, a switching system, and we have two regulators, one for each one of these A and B charging systems. When I cite the ignition and I start it, it's going to start on the B or larger side. As the engine runs, I advance the throttle and I, when I get to 3000 RPM, inside there's an automatic switching of the system and then the A system takes over running the complete engine. The A system not only powers the injectors and, and it also powers the ignition, but in addition, the fuel pumps are connected through this system. And I'll explain the reason of that in a minute. So everything critical to the engine is now running on the smaller 16 amp system. The B system, the larger one, some 30 amps, is now available for the complete running of the engine. So we've doubled the capacity of charging ability for this engine. Uh, in most cases, there's going to be no need for adding an accessory alternator on this engine. So that's actually uh, part of the reason that this engine was designed, so we didn't have to have a lot of accessories added on later. When the engine is running, just kind of on the B, there is a fail-safe system designed internally. There's a series of uh, switches. Now what happens internally if you had a failure, and we have over here, I'll show you the logic profile. This is the ECU, or engine control unit, and you'll notice these are marked A and B. Now, the B side is, this is a map system. This is the two computers actually inside, if you want, are parallel channels. The A side is sensors, so it has a lot more input. All of the sensors on the engine feed the A side. This would be the exhaust gas temperature gauges, your manifold pressure, temperature, and oil pressure, and oil temperature, and coolant temperature, all fed into here. This is a map which uh, looks at RPM and mapping the fuel flow. Now what's going to happen is each one of these powers one set of ignition and one set of injectors separately. If I had a complete failure, uh, say the A side computer, um, then the B side would be able to run it. And the reverse is also possible. If you had a complete generator system fail, it is possible to rig it with a battery power switch so the ignition and the injectors and the fuel pumps will run directly off the battery. 
So we actually have a triple redundancy then in the event of electrical, total electrical failure. Now there's a couple other very nice things about this engine. The concept is this will be developed as a power plant package. It will come with your ring mount, with your exhaust, everything with all the sensors. It comes with the computer, the fuel pumps, and the switch box is all part of the package. That was the only conceivable way to deliver it uh, and have everything work together. There is one other side thing to it. You need to have an engine EFIS system and an engine management system that can read this. So this is running, this particular one is Michael Stock, and this is what we have available for sale for this system. This runs all of the engine readouts, your tachometer, manifold pressure, all of your critical instruments are read here. And the uh, only thing you need to add your aircraft is, on your flight deck is your airspeed and rate of climb and other things that relate to the aircraft itself. So this is, uh, this is an add-on to the engine. There are other manufacturers who are going to make instruments available, such as at some point Dynon and some of the other companies will make them. But it's currently this is the one that works that's available right now for delivery. Um, go ahead. What about fuel for the... Is it going to have any problem with the ethanol and that type of thing that they're using? Dave, our, the, the, the Brotax's objective with this engine was to make it as simple as possible and make it run on modern fuel. So, yes, Avgas can work. However, it can run on um, Antinoc Index 91 or higher. That would be RON 95. But it can also run on E10 as long as it has 91 or higher uh, AKI index knocking. So we can run any basic premium auto fuel, and that's just fine. It was designed from that um, from day one. And part of that reason is, of course, the liquid cooling of the cylinder. Liquid cooling allows us a wide range of anti-knock tolerance. Now, um, this particular system will have um, an ant um, a knock sensor. Not in the very first generation, but the next generation ECU will have a knock sensor in it. So what's going to happen is if somebody makes a mistake with fuel, it will automatically retard the ignition to save the engine. Now, how long before these engines are actually available to customers? Those Dave, right now the engines are being delivered to manufacturers and for prototype installations. The serial run production engines are going online at Rotax in the month of March and April. Deliveries to retail customers and uh, OEMs in large quantities will start sometime in the summer of 2012 in the late July to August area. Home builders will be able to buy them uh, as well, but our first scope is to try to get the manufacturers to make sure the installations are ready and the installation packages and recommendations are ready. Now, is there any change in the TBOs or the maintenance schedules or anything like that on it? Uh, TBO is going to be 2,000 hours, the same as our existing fleet. We've done all the durability testing. We have extensive time on the dynamometers and they've done flight testing. Interestingly, the fact is uh, the maintenance schedules actually are simpler. Several things. First of all, we've removed the carburetors, so there's no more 200-hour carburetor service. And uh, there's no need to adjust anything. We have a single lever control for throttle, one cable, therefore you don't have to readjust your speeds. It is still a mechanical idle screw because under aviation rules, we can't have any uncommanded change in power. So it's unlike your car, which the idle is controlled by the car for warm-up, we don't do that. You still have to do it. There's another change inside the gearbox. Now the gearbox, the gearbox on the outer case is the same, except we have the black coating. But internally, what's happened is uh, we're still running an overload clutch. But in the overload clutch, instead of having a 30-degree free play that we had in the older version overload clutch, this now is a zero-degree free play. So it has then a set periodic maintenance time for removal, reshimming, and check. There is no longer any friction torque requirement that you would do at an annual or 100 hour. Low Tracks Flying Safety Club is already going to integrate the new IS engine for the service level course directly into the existing service level program because oil changes and uh, inspections are compression, for example, all of those remain the same. It's actually simpler to maintain at the service level than the existing ULS engine or 100 horse.
Where it gets a little more complicated is into the maintenance or heavy maintenance level. Obviously, we have a lot more components to remove, and those programs are being written, and as training engines become available, then it'll be integrated into those programs. Our, that's a good question. Our warranties remain exactly the same. We haven't changed anything. It's still, uh, it's going to be 200 hours or 18 months on the ULS version, and it's extended to 400 hours if it's a certified. And certified versions of this engine for aircraft like the Technam Twin, for example, will it, they're anticipated sometime late this summer of 2012. And weight was another thing that I was trying to mention. What kind of weight all are we compared to? Weight? It's uh, if we're to compare the engines equally, when we're talking about installed weight with all the electronics, all the material, muffler, and hanging on, probably going to gain somewhere in around. Uh, four to six kilos, uh, around 16 pounds installed weight because of the additional electronics, the additional fuel pump package, the wiring harness itself. Uh, to be fair, it's a little heavier, but it's still much lighter than any other fuel-injected piston engine. That's a really good question. That's why this engine was made, and that's why the valve covers, and that's why the injector covers are all green. It is to reflect the environmental, eco-friendly part of the engine. If we were to go to 5,000 foot mean sea level and we go to 75% power, say 5,000 RPM, this engine gains over our existing carbureted engine, which is already good, about 21% fuel economy gain. That translates, say, going dropping from 5 gallons to 4 gallons per hour, as an example. Where this thing really is going to shine is if people like to do cross-country and they're going to fly at altitude, obviously, because the sensors are, we're using exhaust gas temperature sensors rather than a Lambda sensor system. Because of avgas, we can't use uh, O2 sensors. We have to just do it through EGT. What's going to happen is you're going to see an average increase in fuel economy, but as you go up in altitude, you're going to see the engine run very clean. You're going to see less rich conditions, and your real economy of savings is people that want to fly higher go long distance. Uh, I know that in testing at the factory, they tested the engine in physical testing up to 18,000 feet and uh, we're still getting performance out of the engine sufficient enough that in the physical testing they could still maintain a 100 foot a minute climb. This was in a Technam uh, small aircraft running at the factory as a test model and pretty significant gain in performance over the carbureted version. Well, the new Rotax webpage name has changed. It's now www.flyrotax.com, and they have the links to all of the manuals that are available online already and all of the technical data. You can also get this uh, by links to the www.rotaxflyingclub.com, and there's a number of other good web pages you can go to. Rotax-owner.com has links to the information as well. I'd suggest people go look for it. If you can't find anything, contact your local service center. Thank you very much for your time, You're welcome.